Metaphysics of physics is the much needed and crucial voice of reason in the philosophy of science, rarely found anywhere else in the world today. We are equipped with the fundamental principles of a rational philosophy that gives us the edge may make us misfits in the mainstream sciences, but also attracts rational minds to our community. With this show, we are fighting for a more rational world mostly by looking through the lens of the philosophy of science. We raise awareness of issues within the philosophy of science and present alternative and rational approaches. We are your hosts and guides through the hallowed halls of the philosophy of science. Dwayne Davies, my husband, is the founder, primary content creator and voice for metaphysics of physics. I am Ashna and I help out however I can. You can find out more about us on the About page of the website. You can also find all the episodes, transcripts, subscription options and more on the website at metaphysicsofphysics.com. Hello, welcome to episode 25 of the Metaphysics of Physics podcast. I am Dwayne Davies, your occasional host. Today, we are going to interview Warren Fay, the author of the best-selling books Fragment and Pandemonium. Some of you may not know what these are. Well, Warren is going to tell us all about them in a little bit. They are science thrillers, something along the lines of Jurassic Park. You can probably gather by the fact that I am interviewing him about these books that I have read them and that I probably enjoy them. Yes, I have read them and yes, I do enjoy them. Fragment and the sequel are amazingly interesting books with some extremely compelling biological theories. There are some truly terrifying nightmare creatures in both of them. They make the dinosaurs and monsters in other books seem tame. Dragons? T-Rexes, the critters in these books, such as the spikers, are much, much deadlier and scarier. I also quite like the main cast of characters, but I cannot talk much about that without some spoilers. But two of them are biologists, and they may have some fascinating biological ideas, new and old. Highly recommended. But more than that, and as entertaining as the scary monsters are, you might also learn something reading these books. Now we have that out of the way, let's get back into things. Thank you for being here, Warren. Give us a brief introduction to Fragment and Pandemonium. Later questions will focus more on the science and the like. So maybe for now, focus more on the theme and plot. Perfect. All right. Well, Fragment and Pandemonium are science thrillers, somewhat in the, the vein of Michael Crichton books, um, which happen to be my favorite kind of thriller. I like to read a, a thriller and get something out of it, get some new information, learn something. So that was uh, the kind of book I decided I wanted to write. And since I was a kid, I've been writing, I've been studying evolution ever since I dug a fossil out of the hills behind my grandparents' home when I was eight. And uh, ever since then, I've been fascinated by evolution. So I decided to, you know, mine that avenue for a thriller, since I hadn't really seen one ever deal with the concept of a completely separate evolution that was isolated and went off in a completely different direction, resulting in an entire ecosystem of almost alien uh, creatures. And if you went back far enough, I figured you could actually make a, a very compelling world. And so Fragment and Pandemonium are just that. Fragment is the story of a fragment of, a, of an ancient supercontinent uh, that had been isolated for 550 million years and was lost in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean, uh, right in the middle of the Roaring Forties, which is a current that ships try to avoid 
in their shipping routes. And uh, I decided to put a reality TV show that's in, you know, that's circumnavigating the world uh, in the path of this island. And what they discover, of course, is uh, an alien world of such, uh, such a dangerous world that uh, they're almost all slaughtered on live television <laughs> as they land. Um, and this calls attention to the, the uh, United States government and the Navy isolates the island and sends in a team of scientists to find out what in the world is going on. Um, and what they discover is, is a world that if any of the species from it were to escape and get to the rest of the world, it would be only a matter of time before they knocked out the legs from every single ecosystem on planet Earth. So that's the premise of Fragment. Pandemonium is the sequel which has some of the survivors moving on to yet another ecosystem that has been isolated uh, in a giant cave system under the Ural Mountains in a fictitious country. And within that uh, cave system, the uh, former Soviet Union has built a gigantic city from which to escape any possible pandemonium from uh, any kind of worldwide nuclear conflagration. So then we discover an entirely different universe of creatures an ecosystem that descended instead of from the cambrian era like fragment descended from uh, the the uh, devonian uh, in which uh, a molluscan ecosystem is chiefly um, mus mollusks instead of arthropods like the cambrian era descendants and uh, so we have an entire, once again, another uh, menu of, of crazy uh, monstrous animals to deal with. So those are the two science heavy books and they incorporate a lot of different new theories and uh, required a lot of interesting research. That fossil you dug up when you were eight, did you ever find out what it was? I did, in fact, it was just one leaf from a fern. And uh, my uncle was a geophysicist and he identified it for me. He had collected a lot of trilobites from a, a nearby quarry and that had, those really uh, fired my imagination. And so many years later, I would write fragment about a world that had descended from that era, the, the era of trilobites and what the, what, if they had gone off on their own, separate from everything else on planet earth, what would they look like half a billion years later? Hmm. Okay. Now we can talk about some of the science ideas in the book. Tell us about some of those. Well, there, there, I, since I've been studying evolution since I was a kid, I have uh, been sort of like an armchair biologist, of, you know, endlessly fascinated by, by, uh, by the process of evolution. And uh, three theories along the way occurred to me while I was studying various different aspects of evolution. And one of the, uh, there are two such theories presented in Fragment, which are original theories and uh, which have actually, um, one of the, which has uh, actually listed some interest from some actual geneticists who are studying lifespan. And uh, that particular theory, the theory of lifespan and what, what actually dictates the lifespan of species, all species on earth, derived basically from looking at barnacles. Barnacles are something that fascinated Darwin to no end, um, and they are amazing creatures. People don't seem to really understand that they're crustaceans, like crabs or, or lobsters. And uh, they're obviously the weirdest crustacean on Earth. The fact that they only live about two years versus mussels that live right next to them, which have almost an unlimited lifespan, they can live up to 70 years. So I was thinking, why in the world? would these two species have such a vastly different lifespan? As I studied it, I realized that there was a difference between the way they procreate. Of course, mussels procreate by, by this huge bloom of sex cells that they all release all at the same time. Trillions of sex cells that drift in a cloud and, and uh, end up creating the next uh, generation. And barnacles, however, have the largest sexual member of uh, in proportion to body size of any animal on earth they have to procreate by literally reaching it over to the next neighbor next to it in order to um <laughs> in order to inseminate that neighbor and then that's how they create the next generation so that was a clue in the fact that they reach sexual maturity in one year and die by the time their offspring reach sexual maturity 
was a giant clue. And to, of course, all species on earth become unable to procreate if they mate with their offspring. And that there's all kinds of different reasons and biological barriers that stop that from happening. And if they, if they didn't stop that from happening, then that species would die out in very short order. Even plants that procreate with uh, their own offspring will become unable to procreate in only two or three generations. So I, as I started to check this theory out by looking at animals and plants with lifespans, I found that the theory held true with absolutely every species across the board. Any animal that, was, that could you know, theoretically cross uh, breed with their own offspring had a fixed lifespan at twice the age of sexual maturity so that they could not compete with the next generation and mate with their own offspring. And this is true from everything from uh, redwoods and sequoias to, to whales to uh, any species that you can name. And uh, certain species get around it without lifespan because they don't need it. For instance, sequoias uh, mate the same way that mussels do or the coral reefs do with giant clouds of sex cells that are all released at once and the chances of them actually you know breeding with their own offspring are so slim that they're they're infinitesimal they're they're vanishingly small however if you look at uh like whales also congregate in giant groups so there's no way you know they, they don't mate for life or anything they just they randomly mix in these mixers as they meet several times a year and uh, that makes it impossible for them so certain bowhead whales have been They've been discovered to have lived about 250 years, for instance, um, and sequoias li live two, three thousand years, um, virtually unlimited lifespans. However, then you look at uh, animals that that live in small groups, rabbits, for instance, they reach sexual maturity in a year and they die at two years because they're in a small group right you know, next to their own offspring and they have to just die off so that there's no chance. Uh, so this is just uh, an amazing, like for instance, turkeys, which are, you know, these virtually flightless, very stupid birds that uh, kind of move around in the same area, die in about two years. Um, after one year, they reach sexual maturity. Two years later, they die. Ostriches that mate for life don't have any, pro you know, there's no risk of them ever mating with their own offspring because they mate for life and they can live 60, 70, 80 years. So the the theory was just absolutely held true all the way through so i decided to include that as one of the characters own theories since the two protagonist uh, scientists in the book are believe that you should always think outside the box when you're trying to analyze what's going on in any particular biological system and so i gave these theories to those the those um, scientists in the book and um, the second, the second one is about life, uh, about how the origin of sex, and that uh, certain cells were carnivores. Single-celled animals used to attack other single-celled animals, and uh, they ended up mingling their DNA, and it became a profitable solution to the predator-prey relationship, and that males would end up becoming uh, the, the you know, inheriting genes from the females, and the females likewise from the males. And that that would give them a, an evolution in tandem through uh, as they became partners instead of enemies. That's that's one of the theories. And in the, then in pandemonium, there's the theory of evolution, of human evolution. And you know, often people would say, well, how is it so? How is it possible for human beings to have evolved so rapidly and in such a, a direction that conforms so perfectly to the needs of a highly sentient creature? for instance, developing vocal cords and uh, that that and the dexterity of our mouths and tongues and the ability to make so many different sounds in vocalization or opposable thumbs that are so perfect for making tools. And how did all this, you know, uh, dovetail so perfectly with with the needs of an intellectual animal? And so the that theory is that that we have, in a sense, invented ourselves the first time a an ancestor of human beings decided to use language, it set a new stage for success. And any, any one of the descendants of those animals that had, had developed that 
the, the idea of language culturally, would then select for all those within that group that could utilize that idea uh, most successfully and therefore pass along their genes to the next generation, whereas those who are less able to would have less of a chance to pass their genes on to the next generation. And so every idea that humans came up with set the stage for a new selection process from that point forward, and therefore we evolved to express our ideas. And in that way, in that sense, we invented ourselves and sped up our evolution in a particular direction. So those are the, the theories that are presented in the book as fire-breathing chats, which are delivered by the main protagonists of the books. It's a long-winded uh, explanation, but you know, they're scientific theories, so. <laughs> All right, in one of the fire-breathing chats, Nell mentions how Dawkins' meme theory is something of a follow-up to the theory of self-directed human evolution, which you were just talking about. Would you care to elaborate? That was, um, you know, the theory that, uh, that ideas in, that, or memes translate into genes, that our memes are selected for and they select our genes moving forward so that they have a very close corollary and very close interaction in evolution. It's true with other animals too. For instance, if they're driven out of a habitat and they now have a different, different items of food, will start to evolve if, they, if their behavior changes to actually utilize those other sources of food, they will start to evolve to capture that food in a more efficient manner. So ideas and behavior dictate evolution. And in that sense, we sort of direct our own evolution and, and human beings have directed their own evolution. In that same section, you mentioned the thing that distinguishes humans from the rest of the animal kingdom. Would you care to elaborate more on what this thing is? You kind of touched on it. I'll just sum it up in the sense that uh, we're the, these two species are the only species that actually direct their own evolution by first coming up with an idea that they may not be completely capable of, of executing. For instance, the first time someone picked up a rock and said, hey, you know, look, we can make a tool. We can make a sharp edge if we smack these together. That creature may not have had very good opposable thumbs. He did have the idea, however, to make this. And from that point forward, all of the other members of his group, if they had better thumbs, would be more proficient at using that idea. And they would therefore be more successful mating and passing along their genes to the next generation. So the idea would end up selecting the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And each one would have a better facility at, at using tools with hand to eye coordination, opposable thumbs, et cetera. And even brain centers that were, that, were, um, that were needed for that activity would be selected for moving forward. So that we're kind of the only creature that created themselves with their own ideas. And that's the basic idea. Yeah, kind of a, it adds a corollary to Dawkins theory. Okay, you have touched on this one too. What inspired you to write Fragment and Pandemonium. What were some of your influences? Well, for Fragment, actually, there was one specific thing that gave me the, the idea for Fragment, and that was I was um, studying the discovery in Romania of a cave called the Mobile Caves. And it was isolated for 5 million years, no contact with the surface whatsoever. And when uh, researchers went down into this cave, which was about like the size of, say, a cathedral, and was covered with a, a lake that was covered with a thick mat of microbial, of microbes, and had been completely cut off from sunlight. And yet in this cave existed 33 species that didn't exist anywhere else on the planet. And it was, this was only after 5 million years of isolation. And so that idea occurred to me that, you know, there are many lost world uh, novels and, you know, adventure stories where usually you have the world frozen in time, right? That's the, the original Arthur Conan Doyle lost world scenario where um, because these creatures have been isolated, they've been frozen in time. And now there's dinosaurs and, you know, all kinds of prim primitive uh, prehistoric creatures. That's not really the way evolution works, though. When things are isolated, they start 
drifting genetically away from where they their starting point and their the point when they were isolated so the idea that we could that you could create a lost world scenario for an adventure story based on long-term isolation that would create almost an alien world right here on planet earth immediately formed in my mind and and that's when i started work on it so that was the original inspiration yeah <laughs> i thought that was weird that whole frozen time thing i mean i don't know why you know anyone who understands evolution would think that but conan doyle had all kinds of weird ideas i guess <laughs> yeah and i think at the time that you know it was rather you know the idea of evolution was, was hadn't completely sunk in and so people were finding you know they were looking for living fossils basically and they're looking for uh, throwbacks that that were clues to evolution but they weren't really thinking about the fact that that isolation would would actually create a genetic drift into a different direction and and that's uh you know it was it's we're we're much more sophisticated now than they were then yeah this was back when they still believed richard owens idea of dinosaurs being slow swamp dwelling critters there were a lot of uh, of mistaken ideas at that time it was also new but now um it was time for an update on that you know that idea and so i decided to go all the way back to the cambrian explosion and say wow look at the, spe the species in from this time and imagine if they had just continued in an unbroken line from that point isolated from all the rest of the world that had gone through so many environmental upheavals that they kept getting thinned out by extinction events but this this particular uh, fragment of a supercontinent that continued to dwindle down to the almost like a two mile wide radius had been a an unbroken part of the world where, where that that evolutionary progress continued and was never interrupted so that's that's the basis of how Henders Island came to exist. Tell us about any real world islands or caves where some of, where some unusual wildlife has been found. Oh yeah. Oh, well, there's, there's uh, terrific ones. Actually about a couple of months after fragment came out a, a team of uh, scientists from the Smithsonian Institute visited Papua New Guinea and they explored the Basavi crater um, which is almost the same exact size of Henders Island and it uh, at the bottom of this volcanic crater which had been uh, all, you know the life inside this crater had been isolated for uh, millions of years and they found kangaroos that live in trees and frogs with fangs and rats the size of dogs just an entirely different ecosystem was dwelling at the, at the bottom of this crater and it was uh it was absolutely stunning to them they were they, they explained it this is like as if there was an island in the middle of nowhere isolated for for millions of years and and all everything inside it had drifted in, in its own direction so that happened two months after fragment came out and it was i was pretty amazed by that but obviously australia new zealand madagascar the seychelles these are all places where we that are known for their distinct species and um you know very interesting uh throwbacks and uh, you know of course on uh, on australia we have the, the everything proceeded from marsupials and and there were the the age of mammals never arrived there so those are great obvious examples but my, i think my favorite probably is socotra island where the the tree species on that island and there's almost everything on the island looks like it came from a, an alien planet the tree species are uh, were a big inspiration for the tree quote unquote um species that are on the island of, of henders and their caves too i mean for instance there was a cave uh, discovered in the sequoia national park where all of again again cave species almost always have completely distinct species that have that are nowhere else to be found and this this cave system was no different but uh some of the species inside the cave evolved to live in only one room of the cave so that's how specialized uh, they had uh, these creatures had become just because they were isolated inside this cave 
Hmm. Okay. What are some of the weirdest real life species, extinct or extant? Which ones might you like to talk about now? I guess you've covered some of them, but there are, of course, lots of others you have not covered. Yeah, certainly. Uh, of course, stomatopods or mantis shrimp uh, feature in the book uh, quite a bit. Those are some of the most extraordinary creatures. If there was probably ever going to be a creature that replaced us on planet Earth, I like to think the mantis shrimp would be that creature. You know, we have three color receptors. Mantis shrimp have 12. So they see millions of colors we can't see. They have a punch with their with their four, one, some of their four legs, which uh, can shatter bulletproof glass. They have incredible uh, uh, sight acuity. They, their eyes have three different pupils in each eye. So they see more than stereophonic, uh, the, the stereo uh, le, uh, vision um, with each eye. And so that enables them to track fast moving prey and strike it as it's moving past much more efficiently than any other animal on earth. And they have a nervous system, which is extremely advanced. So they're, they're amazing. If you, you know, octopus have uh, arguably nine brains, eight for each of their arms. One of my favorite animals are tree hoppers. And just because of the most insane shapes and sizes and colors, tiny little uh, insects, which jump around on plants and trees, which are almost everywhere in every backyard, but um, uh, are, there's literally tens of thousands of species all around the world, mostly overlooked because of their size, but they are incredible. This an infinite number, as you can see on my website, I'm always posting about a, a new species on my Facebook page every day, just to show the, the vast variety of, of amazing creatures uh, that are out there, some of which I did not find out about until after designing the at the creatures on Henders Island and on and in Pandemonium, uh, because an entire fictitious ecosystem is in both books. And um, like I, for instance, um, designed a creature. I, mostly, I was trying to come up with creatures that locomoted in a completely alien way. And some of the creatures, like Henders rats and spiders, locomote with a a tail that springs and and lunges them forward through the trees and i thought okay that's going to be a new something completely new turns out springtails have been around forever and they do exactly the same thing <laughs> so also the of course the idea of the discants which roll you know that's their the way they locomote i thought i'd never find anything like that <clears throat> but there are spiders that i found out uh, after the book came out that do in fact uh, turn on their sides and roll down sand dunes in the sahara desert so th almost anything you can come up with that is at least physically possible has been you know uh, tried out by evolution and uh, that's one of the most um, staggering things about about the planet there's so much that we that we can't imagine and even if we could it's already been been it's already happened it's hard to think of something evolution hasn't already tried <laughs> indeed okay why do you think that knowledge of evolution, biology, anthropology, etc., are important? And why do you think so many people want to pretend that it isn't? Well, I think that, um, you know, I think one of the reasons that people intuitively look at human beings and say, this can't be the process of evolution, right? It must be God, right, that created this, because we are so perfectly uh, adapted to. Uh, the life of an intellectual creature, that it seems like an in, that the mind of an intellectual creature created us. And my argument is, yes, that's correct. But we are that creature that created ourselves. And it's important to understand that because there tends to be this conflict between evolution and creationism that says something as uh, as specifically evolved to be human could not have just come about accidentally through a giant uh, chain of accidents. And I would say that's correct. It, it is not in conflict with the scientific theory of evolution, however, if we understand that our ideas have directed 
specifically our own evolution. And so it reconciles that problem that otherwise people would say, oh, well, it's got to be a divine spark. Well, yes, it was in a sense. It was, but it was ourselves that created that divine smart spark and that, that directed the way we would evolve moving forward. So we are different from all other animals on, in the world in that way. And that's why we seem to stand so far apart from other animals. Uh, and that's a very important thing to understand rather than have this endless irreconcilable conflict between religion and science. There is this other idea that the moment we developed opposable thumbs, that we started to direct our own evolution. That is not quite what you are proposing, but kind of similar. It's kind of similar. I, I would say that it's a little bit the cart before the horse, though, in the sense that I think that the maybe the first person you know, who it, uh, used or uh, you know, who came up with an idea that required opposable thumbs was probably pretty clumsy at trying to put that idea into effect. But as soon as he that idea took hold, any other member of the group who had a better, uh, you know, slightly better arrangement of thumbs and of, of you know, thumbs to to hand would obviously be much, instantly much more successful and would would pass on their genes more successfully to the next generation so the idea would come first like for instance uh, first somebody came up with the idea of look wait we can use a sound to signify something out there and maybe it was just a grunt and that meant mastodon and as soon as that idea of using language to name things in the world took took flight then, of course, people who could make more uh, distinguishable sounds became very successful within that group and in that culture. And they would be more likely to pass on their genes and their pursuant generations would get better and better at utilizing the idea of speech. So the idea has to come first and set the stage for success. And then everything that implements that idea more successfully has more children and therefore passes along their genes more successfully. So that's the order of things, I believe. We're not the only hominid species to have opposable thumbs. The Neanderthals had them, but they are not around anymore. That's right. <laughs> they're not. Uh, and they're, at, at one time, there were at least like five or six different kinds of human, you, you might say, on planet Earth. The Neanderthals, the Denisovans, the uh, Homo erectus, the uh, hobbits, as they're called, on the island of Flores, and uh, and Homo sapiens all coexisted um, at a one time on planet Earth. So it was it was the most successful species of those us that ended up um, getting through the bottleneck and and uh, surviving today. <laughs> I wondered how long it would take for someone to mention Jurassic Park. By the way. I think your books are a lot scarier than Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people tell me that. Yeah, well, it was meant to be. And, and uh, but of course, I couldn't possibly have, have uh, written the book uh, without the great Michael Crichton, you know, the, the blazing the trail. Uh, there's an interesting little story, uh, kind of a bittersweet story. When I, when I first uh, submitted the, the novel for uh, two publishing houses, the HarperCollins in England there was a big bidding war at the London Book Fair and they and Harper Collins won the war. And I went to London to meet my editors and uh, they said, how, how did you do it? We get 2,500 wannabe Michael Crichton novels every single year and all of them are, are terrible. And uh, how did you do this? And uh, I, I said, I gave you know, credit where it's due. Crichton was a great example. And uh, then, uh, then a woman came up to me at this um, party and said, you know, she had tears in her eyes. She said, we're so you know, privileged to publish your novel. And thank you very much for going with Harper Collins. And, oh, well, that's my honor. Thank you. And she left. And then they told me that's Michael Crichton's editor right there. Then uh, after the party, um, some people rushed up to us and said, uh, uh, we have terrible news. Michael Crichton just died. And he, and that's why his editor had tears in her eyes. So it was, it was a real shock. And, uh, and I had hoped to meet him, really. And uh, that was as close as I came, so. How many times did you read Jurassic Park when you were younger? I was pretty um, <laughs> dinosaur crazy or something when I was a kid. I read that book like 11 times or something, insane like that. 
Well, I read very slowly and I read a book once and I just absorb it completely. So that's because I'm really looking at si- at sentence structure, you know, the, the overall story structure, all those things when I'm reading. So, you know, I, I but um, yeah, so I, I rarely revisit books. I, I just sort of like mimeograph them in my mind, uh, <laughs> uh, have them there uh, at my my disposal in uh, mentally. <laughs> okay. And what are some of your favorite books in these fields? Yeah, well, I think one of the one of the great pleasures that I've had through the years is watching David Attenborough's documentaries and reading his books. I read Life on Earth, uh, for instance, and, and some of his other books and then watched. I actually got a, a, a video DVD player um, that plays United Kingdom region DVDs just so I could watch the unabridged version of Life on Earth, which is about 10 times larger than the one that was available in the United States. And uh, it goes through the entire evolution of life using living examples that that still represent each stage of life's evolution. Uh, so those, great, those are great. Carl Sagan's books are great popularizers of science that are great for people who are just uh, starting to look into these things. Obviously, there's lots of textbooks, but they're very dry. Uh, I did study biology in college, and, and those were very useful, but I wouldn't be able to name the author or the titles off the top of my head. They're just very dry text type books. But um, those are terrific. I also am very fascinated by the Ediacara, which were a, a very mysterious group of animals that existed before the Cambrian explosion. and there are theories that they all died off completely and were replaced by the next generation of animals. Uh, and there is a book called The Garden of Ediacara by Mark McMenamin, which was very fascinating. I really enjoyed that. And so, you know, those are those are great starting points. And Crichton, of course, as well. He's, you know, you can learn a lot from Crichton's books. So those and and documentaries and and uh, dinosaur books are always fun. So, yeah, <laughs> a lot of those. I have been reading a lot of Donald Pesero myself lately. Have you read any of his books? No, uh, but um, but I, I loved uh, the books uh, by Stephen Jay Gould, Wonderful Life, uh, uh, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History is, is a terrific book. Uh, and and uh, The Origin of Species is a terrific book. So, uh, but Stephen Jay Gould is a, is a really uh, exciting writer and it's, it's really fun to look at at some of his uh, theories. I can read a couple quotes to you from Steve, Stephen Jay Gould's Wonderful Life that you can see some inspiration for Fragment in, if you'd like. Oh, yes, please. Okay, here's one. Alter any event ever so slightly and without apparent importance at the time, and evolution cascades into a, a radically different channel. That's from Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History by Stephen Jay Gould. Here's another. Some 15 to 20 Burgess species cannot be allied with any known group and should probably be classified as separate phyla. Magnify some of them beyond the few centimeters of their actual size and you're on the set of a science fiction film. Here's another. I'll I'll give you one more. If Ediacara survivors had been able to evolve internal complexity later on, then the pathways from this radically different starting point would have produced a world worthy of science fiction at its best. That's uh, another quote from that same book. So yes, um, those were inspirational. Hmm. I don't think I've read that one yet. Fragment has a whole bunch of crazy and fantastic arthropods, and Pandemonium has a lot of weird mollusks. Did you choose these phyla because they are so diverse and amazing, or because they are personal favorites of yours, or what? I guess a bit of both, really. Yeah, oh, absolutely both. Uh, and also because they both emerged long enough ago for them to have had plenty of time to evolve in a lot of even weirder directions. Um, you know, if something that was too recent would be, you know, difficult to account for, you know, very uh, imaginative um, evolutionary adaptations. So to go all the way back to when cephalopods uh, first appeared and then sort of had a, an entire dynasty where they took over the world, just like arthropods had before them in the Cambrian era. Uh, in, and those are long enough times away, like 550 million years for arthropods 
and for cephalopods, even though they were around during the Cambrian, they they didn't really take off until the age of ammonites, you know, that were that filled the seas with these giant nautili, nautilus-like uh, shells, and uh, uh, created all, all all kinds of different kinds of um, species had had blossomed during that age, and so and that was about you know 300 million years ago. So that was enough time for them to to adapt to these isolated ecosystems on for instance Henders Island or in Pandemonium the uh, the cave system under the Ural Mountains so that's that was um and of course yeah there's enough variation of those species to have all kinds of stuff to to uh choose from for creating uh, amazing animals what are some of the most controversial biological ideas which you were interested in of course, genetics is is the whole future frontier that is the most interesting, unquestionably. But uh, the thing I'm most interested in is the fairly new emerging science regarding epigenetics, which really challenges a lot of our concepts of evolution. And uh, epigenetics is, you know, uh, there, there's a big uh, a debate historically in biology between the Lamarckians and the Darwinians. And Lamarck believed, for instance, that the, that the reason that giraffes developed long necks was because they kept reaching up higher into the, into the trees to get leaves to eat. And because they kept straining their necks upward, their children inherited longer necks. That was the Lamarckian theory before Darwin came along and said, no, 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 it's natural selection and, and had a completely different theory of how things evolved. So that was the that was the uh, the argument for so long, and now epigenetics comes along, and that is the idea that genes are modified by certain behaviors during a person's life, which almost starts moving back towards a Lamarckian idea, uh, and that that genetics can be affected by behavior, and that beha that those genetics can then be passed on to the next generation. That's a fascinating new frontier. So that I would say is most fascinating. And I think that the the other um, most mysterious group of life uh, that has that is still quite mysterious would be the uh, the fungi. Some of the very, very oldest species or group of animals to to appear on planet Earth. They now believe that it far that the that the first fungi existed you know, far past 1 billion years ago, which is certainly before a lot of almost every other kind of life. So I think that that is, that's, that's a frontier that I would love to explore in a future book. Speaking of which, tell us about your next book. When can we read it? And when you finish it, where can we get it? Well, the next book and the final book in the Fragment trilogy uh, will be called Symbiont, and it will explore the world of fungi. It'll be set in the Pacific Northwest in a deep old growth forest. And uh, I really don't want to say too much about it, but um, it will include some of this, uh, our favorite characters from the series. And um, it will probably be finished within a year. And after that, it will be available wherever books are sold. So. What are some of your favorite books and authors? I think we've pretty much covered this one. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I don't read a lot of contemporary fiction. I, I, I mostly read classics and, and, uh, and nonfiction. But uh, obviously Crichton, Conan Doyle, I love all the Sherlock Holmes stories. I, I really do. Those are wonderful. Victor Hugo, Martin Amos is an amazing author. Mark Twain, fantastic. I love uh, style, stylists uh, like Flaubert and Bukowski and Fonte and Hemingway. Agatha Christie's really great, really fun. Uh, Stephen King, some of it, fantastic. I, I really love. Prince of Tides is an amazing book by Pat Conroy. Uh, Tolkien and Asimov and Bradbury, Cornell, Philip K. Dick, Murtry, Ran Raymond Chandler, James M. Cain. Frankenstein's an amazing book. Uh, Homer and Orwell, yeah. Maybe uh, you know Ursula K. Le Guin. A lot, a lot of great writers, great stylists with with very uh, distinct voices. Okay, 
and what are some of your biggest literary influences? Oops, <laughs> you've kind of answered this one too to some extent. Well, yeah, I mean, those all, probably all the books that you read add to the stew um, of your own style um, and, and your own influences. And I would say all of those certainly have added something along the way. And then from that, you, you develop your own style. So yeah, all those books would, would have been uh, all uh, good, good soil from which to grow um, a distinct voice of your own, you know. Okay, yeah. What kind of research did you do for your books? Oh, lots and lots and lots of research. That as soon as I knew I was going to write this book in a modern setting, it was obviously important to get uh, the state of the art science right. And it's a big challenge because you're developing an entire ecosystem, you know, not from whole cloth, but one that doesn't exist. And uh, so I immediately started plunging into research the uh, in books and on the internet. And the internet has an amazing amount of, of resources that if you're digging into highly specialized science, you can find uh, papers on any particular kind of question you might have. And I just reached out to experts in the field. You know, any kind of question I had um, on, about certain species, I would, I would uh, just reach out to experts and, and find out, you know, get some of their off the top of their head answers and then further pursue that with more, more research. So yeah, it, 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 uh, luckily I had been also researching all my life biology. It was just a, a real favorite pastime. So yeah, there was a, a ton of research that went into it. And then I also ran it past these experts, you know, so that to see, you know, their own objections and, and uh, adjust things accordingly. So it would sound and be uh, something that, that would pass muster and would be enjoyable for for actual scientists to read the book and I, and indeed that's how it's turned out and the book is used to teach biology in spain and various different courses that american colleges use it so it's it's the the amount of research has been appreciated in the scientific community even though of course it's obviously a book that's um fun and requires a lot of suspension of disbelief but uh, it's it's a it's credible enough for them to take the the roller coaster ride and have fun. On your blog, we can see this quote: "Since Fragment came out, a number of other isolated ecosystems have been discovered. Each one astonishing scientists with the variety of the unprecedented plants and animals. Would you like to tell us about some of these?" amazing discoveries? There are some other really fun ones to investigate. Of course, the Mobile Cave in Romania was a big inspiration for Fragment and would end up being an even bigger inspiration for Pandemonium. The Basavi Crater of Papua New Guinea came out after Fragment, but is almost like the same story. The deep uh, ecosystems around Antarctica have yielded hundreds of new species. Uh, the subterranean lake in Antarctica, uh, Lake Vostok, it was, uh, you know, a much anticipated discovery as, as people finally drilled through the ice and got to see the species that had been isolated in that lake for a very great period of time. Lake Bokal in, near the Ural Mountains uh, is the largest body of fresh water on Earth, and uh, it has an amazingly diverse ecosystem of species that you won't find anywhere else and uh, even uh, freshwater coral just an amazing place and then the, you know like sealed caves like the uh, that in Sequoia National Park which have you know species that are unique to only one room in the cave and things like that so all islands that have uh, been isolated for an, uh, a long period of time have very specialized unique species like the Seychelles or Papua New Guinea or uh, uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia, of course, Madagascar, even Hawaii. It's only been isolated for only existed for five million years, but there are a whole plethora of bird species that evolved there, nowhere else, and plant species. So yes, uh, those are there's many, 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 and mostly you would find uh, that they're isolated systems that are going to yield the most unique ecosystems, and and they would be lakes, under uh, caves, islands, uh, things like that.
that's where you'll find them. Okay, you have a Patreon account where our listeners can go to to support your work. Time to plug your Patreon. Yes, yes, very, very much appreciated. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> publishing doesn't always help you financially, uh, kids. <laughs> Sometimes you end up worse off having published a book um, and then than you were before. But um, so yes, it does help me keep writing to to uh, contribute a bit uh, to my Patreon account, which is Warren Fay at Patreon. And uh, I have a PayPal account um, and generous fans can help me keep body and soul together by visiting and contributing, throwing uh, a few a few pence into the hat, as it were. And uh, they're located at my website, which is warrenfay.com. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, very good. Thank you for, for asking. Right. That's great. Go check all that out and maybe make a contribution. And now a couple of reader questions. First, where do you get the ideas for these amazing creatures in your books? Yeah, well, um, you know, I started with the, the, the starting point of um, saying, okay, what I'm going to do is try to come up with the most alien kind of, of um, behaviors, especially through locomotion, that uh, from every anything else that you've ever seen. So as soon as you look at these creatures, you're like, oh my God, this is not something that, that we've ever encountered before. And so that way I, I just looked and said, it's not going to be, it's not going to run like a dinosaur. It's not going to act like a, a mammal. It's not going to act like a, like mollusks that we know of. It's going to have a completely new and different combination of, of behaviors. And so starting from just like trying to go at right angles to everything that existed, already and uh and then say okay how can we evolve to get to that you know this far out thing that we've never seen before and build the, and, and fill in the the dots between uh what we do know and and this crazy thing that we've never imagined so that was a that was a good way to to design them just to design them at right angles to everything we already know that's essentially what i did and of course make them real scary <laughs> for sure all right, next question. Where are you keeping Hinder? Ah, yes. Well, that's somewhat of a secret. Of course, he, he loves the island of Kauai, so he is somewhere on that island. That's as much as I can say. That's as much as I'm at liberty to say. That was the last question I typed up here. Well, that was great. Thank you. Was there anything else you wanted to comment on? No, it's just it's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun talking, Dwayne, and uh, go, going through all of this uh, this background for for my books. And I would just say, uh, if, if people are interested in this, this in in science and archaeology and and these these topics, and want to see some new theories and ideas uh, about them, uh, I would highly uh, recommend that they read these books. They pick them up and read Fragment and Pandemonium and and uh, see for themselves what they think. Yeah, I have read them both, of course. And they are highly, highly enjoyable. Well, thank you so much. It's been very enjoyable. Yeah, I've really enjoyed talking about all the stuff with you. Maybe we can do this again sometime. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. That would be a, a lot of fun. And as I'm uh, doing uh, research into what I consider to be the most mysterious uh, group of, of li you know, life on Earth, the fungi, as I get into more of the uh, research and, and the writing of, of Symbiont, um, it'll be interesting to, to tease some of the uh, research going on there. I, I don't know that much about fungi at this point, but um, cephalopods and monotremes are among my favorites, personally. Oh, monotremes, absolutely. Wow. Well, what a, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just it. It's so great to find these these uh, sort of interstitial species um, that once again hail from isolated ecosystems like Australia. Yeah, fascinating stuff. I keep discovering every almost every week another group of animals that that is my you know favorite uh, obsession of of the day. You know, and, and there's just so many. It's it's hard to just rattle them off off the top of my head which ones are most interesting to me. But yeah, definitely monotremes and arthropods and Ediacara is something that it, it's just a mystery that I that I'm constantly coming back to um, because so the most some of the most mysterious fossils are discovered from time to time that are from the Ediacaran period.
period of time before the Cambrian explosion. And uh, the theories keep going back and forth about where they came from. There was some, some particular region in the middle of the desert of South Africa where they found a canyon and fossils that were embedded in this canyon that seemed to be tiny little toadstools or flower-like fossils. And um, they're from the, the Ediacaran era. And uh, they have absolutely no idea what they are. Are they fungus? Are they plants? Are they animals? Or, you know, they have no clue what they were, but there was like a whole sort of forest of them. And, there's, and that was just recently discovered. And they don't know what the hell they're looking at. Um, so that's, that's the most, you know, that's a, most intriguing to me, and just probably because it's completely impenetrable at this point in time, but hopefully they'll continue to, to uh, discover more sites of that most extraordinarily rare epoch of life on Earth. Oh, wow. So what are some of your favorite cephalopods? Oh, well, you know, I, uh, of course, probably the, the one that uh, inspired the ghost octopus in Pandemonium um, the most would be the uh, mimic octopus. And the mimic octopus can mimic at least 15 different species. So it can swim through the water looking just like a lionfish. Uh, it can extend its tentacles to look like a sea snake. And uh, it goes on and on. It, they can actually look like mantis shrimp, that they bury themselves and they, sh they, they squeeze the shape of their head to look just like mantis shrimp. So they disguise themselves in one thing after another. And not only that, but they they actually dropped a a jar with a handle uh, down into the uh, the water where many mimic octopus lived, and they actually started mimicking those jars. So it's not like they just are driven by an instinct; they actually can see something and then duplicate what they're looking at. So those the, the, that species can even locomote like different species. Only one other animal on planet Earth can do that, and that's us. We can fly, we can scuba dive, we can hang glide, we can bicycle, we can walk, we can walk on our hands. No other animal does this. They all have a way of locomoting, and that's the way they do it. They don't, they can't, you know, antelope don't suddenly walking on, start walking on their front paws. Um, they always locomate a certain way. Well, these mimic octopus can literally walk, you know, they can clump their, their legs together into like four legs, their eight, their eight tentacles into four like legs, and then walk along the bottom as though they're, they're quadrupeds. They can swim like, uh, like fish. They can wriggle like, like snakes. So they're actually changing the way they locomote in the, in, in the ocean. And that is by far the most fascinating cephalopod that I know of, <laughs> Though, except for the ghost octopus, of course, which I invented. So <laughs> Well, as for my favorite, I'm still deciding. I think I might have to go with the Mimic Octopus, though. That one does sound amazing. Well, I think here would be a really good place to wrap up. So I guess we will wrap up here. Thank you very much, Warren. I think we covered quite a lot of ground. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. Cheers. That is all we have for today. Warren, thanks again for your wonderful, fascinating, and in-depth answers. Very thought-provoking and educational stuff there. And if this does not make anyone want to read your books, I don't know what will. Maybe a movie or something. But um, that does not teach you all of this extra stuff you covered here, so maybe not. Again, thank you, Warren. Let's hope we have you on again when the next book in the Fragment trilogy, Symbiont, comes out. All right, thank you for listening. Until next episode, Stay rational. If you find value in these podcasts and would like to support us while getting access to bonus content, please consider becoming a patron. You can do so easily by visiting the patrons page on the website, link provided in the show notes. Thanks to all those who are already patrons of the show. Remember to check out the website to read more articles, Subscribe if you like our podcast, sign up to our email newsletter or follow us on Facebook, Twitter to get the updates. You can also check out our Metaphysics of Physics merchandise if you wish. All profits from these go back into the show. And as always, you are welcome to send in questions to 
questions at metaphysicsofphysics.com. Or you can also contact us via contact at metaphysicsofphysics.com if you want to talk to us about physics, philosophy of science, any of the other sciences or anything relevant at all. We are always looking for more people to interview or appear on the show. Please tune in for the next episode and start thinking of some questions. Until then, stay rational. Thank you.